Hello, my name is Calvin Bergsma, the pastor at Georgetown Christian Fellowship, which meets in Hudsonville, Michigan. The following is a message that was delivered on Sunday morning. Be blessed as you join us in the service that's already in progress. I appreciate the prophetic word this morning because I believe that God is calling us back to very simple truths of the Bible. Calling us back to, to doctrinal purity. How many of you realize there's a lot of stuff out there? Now, I love the Internet, but how many of you know you need to be very, very careful what you read on the Internet? Please don't swallow everything. You know, I was kind of mean when I was a little boy, and we had a tree on our farm, and Every year there would be a bird that would build a nest in that tree. Now, now realize I spend hundreds of dollars feeding birds every year now, okay? But back then I wasn't saved. I wasn't even thinking about getting saved, okay? <laughs> I'd crawl up that tree and I'd put a bunch of little stones in my pockets or BBs or something, you know. I'd shake that nest and those little birds would pop their mouth open and I'd fill them up. And then they'd die. But anyway... Uh, but a lot of times I think Christians are like that. I mean, you shake the nest and their little mouth just pops open. Ah, what do I got? What can I have? And I believe with all of my heart that God is calling us back to a place of doctrinal purity, to a place of, of deeper understanding of the foundations that we have built our lives upon. And this morning I want to talk to you about the subject of repentance. I know that this is not a, a <clears throat> very popular subject. I know some people think that repentance is just something you do one time and then it's all over, everything's cool. Let me just say this to you. I find out that repentance is something I have to live in. Amen. Because that attitude of repentance keeps me walking with God. So I want to talk to you about repentance, or actually the title of this message, and you can see it up there, is Attitudes of Repentance. But before we get into that, I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of, of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, the 7th chapter. Let's see if I can get this. Oh, it's not on there. Let me just read this to you. 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, gives us a definition of what repentance is. And it says here, the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful, and that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Now, how many of you ever said you were sorry for something you did? And then you turned right around and did it again? Okay. Well, sorrow is not repentance. Repentance, there's a, a, a part of, of repentance that includes sorrow. Okay, but it's not just being sorry, but it's a, a being sorry to the point of changing our lives, of changing us. And then I want us to look at verse number 11 and actually just the very first phrase of verse number 11. And it says, and behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow produces in you or produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. You see, those things there, and we're only going to talk about one of them today, those things there are things that repentance produces in our life. Brothers and sisters, let me say this to you this morning. If you think that you have repented, but yet you don't see in your life those things that are found. Let me see. Do I have that scripture? There it is. 
If you don't see those things that are found in verse number 11 in your life, then I would really ask yourself, especially if you've been a, a Christian more than five or so years, is my life really a life that's being led in repentance? Do I have these things? Do I have a, an earnestness on the inside of me? Now that word, those two words, and we're going to talk about them um, this morning, but do I have that earnestness inside of me? Do I have this thing that wants to vindicate myself? In other words, to make things right. I know after I became a Christian, not long after I became a Christian, one of the things that the Holy Spirit dealt with me about is about the, the shoplifting I used to do. And I remember I grew up in Newkirk, Iowa. Now, most of you don't have any idea where Newkirk, Iowa, but there is a thing called Newkirk, means new church in the Dutch language, but there is a place called Newkirk, Iowa, and that Newkirk store. And I used to go in there and I would steal the dumbest things. All for the sake of stealing them. Well, after I got saved, you know what? The Holy Spirit says, make a list of what you stole. Find out what the value, not of what you of the day you stole them, but of the value it is today. And he said, I want you to write a check and I want you to send it to that store. Why? I never before that did I ever feel bad about stealing. Why? What was happening? The Holy Spirit was producing something on the inside of me, and I wanted to make sure that it was right. Now, I know that people don't preach this anymore, but I still believe it. Because you know what? It set me free. Do you understand? What indignation? How many of you have been mad at sin? I don't know about you, but I got saved March 20th, 1970 on 56th Avenue, about three quarters of a mile north of Fort Sheldon. I went to bed that night loving the sin I was in. Do you understand? About... 11 o'clock that night, all of a sudden laying there in bed, can't sleep, and the Holy Spirit turns on a camera, and he begins to show me my unrighteousness. You know, when I crawled out of that bed about 1130, didn't take the Holy Spirit real long, and I said, man, if you can take a, a mess like me, you can have me. And I thought I was worse than any sinner in the whole world. How I many you know the Holy Spirit does a good job on people? Amen. You know what? That next morning when I woke up, I didn't want to sin anymore. Something changed on the inside of me. And the more I allowed the Holy Spirit to work in me, the more I hated sin. So what, what indignation, what fear... How many of you know that godly sorrow produces godly fear or a respect of God's holiness in your life? And again, that's not something we talk much about, but someday we'll probably do that, something like that. But what a longing. I didn't want to live for Jesus before I got saved. When I got saved, you know what? That's the only thing I could think of. How can I please him? How can I do what he wants me to do? And again, I want you to understand that all of these things are, are a product of repentance and a zeal. Man, I had a zeal inside of me. I would witness to anything that wouldn't run away from me, and I ran after a couple people. Actually, more than a couple people. I had a zeal on the inside of me. And then the next thing, what avenging of wrong. I tell you what, God is a God of justice. And he avenges. Not me, I don't avenge. But God will avenge what's wrong. So those are fruits of repentance. Now, I want us to go back 
Oh, I got to point it at that thing over there, I guess. There we go. What is repentance? Well, repentance, basically, it comes from the Greek word metaneo, and it's a compound word. The first part of that word is meta, which means or among, and the, the next part of that word is teneo, which means to perceive or to think. And what we would say, if we put those things together, what repentance is, it's a change of mind. How many of you know that you changed your mind when you began to follow Jesus? But how many of you know it took your body a little bit longer to, to, to fall in line? How many of you would be honest with me and stay, and it's still working today? Well, all of your hands went down when I said that. Oh, one of you in the back. It's still working today. Repentance is still alive and working in our lives today. So repentance starts with a change of mind. Now, I want to talk to you about David's repentance. How many of you know David did some things that were wrong? And in David wrote, I believe it's seven songs of repentance. And in Psalms 51, David writes and and he gives us several things that happened in the area of his desires. He says, create in me a clean heart. And so I want us to look at just that phrase today. Because we could spend hours and hours and hours, and and we're not going to do that. But I want us just to, to look at really what David was saying. Now we used to sing this song out of Psalms 51, right? Some of you remember this. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. I'm not going to sing it for you because I don't want you to leave. Okay? (laughs) Nice, melodic type song. Did the Bergs, my brother, sing this song? Yeah, I think they did. Anyway, nice melodic. I remember we used to sing it in Maranatha back in those days. Nice melodic song. But I want you to understand that's not the way David wrote it. Now, if this offends your doctrine a little bit, let's take a look at the Hebrew. What does it say there? The Hebrew word for create Bara. And it means to create or to shape. This word is unique because in the Old Testament, it is only used in reference to God. So here we see David, and he's, and he's writing and he's penning this psalm, and he's basic, basically what David is saying is, God, you are the only one who can create in me a clean heart you see I got news for you this morning if you think you can change your heart good no I don't want to say good luck because I don't believe in good luck but it isn't gonna work you cannot change your heart you see those things that I told you about this morning about my own repentance story those weren't things that I just thought well you know I think I'm just gonna go do this No, those were things that were brought up to me by the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit brings you to, brings to your consciousness something that you're doing wrong, He also gives you the ability, or if we can use this word, the grace to change. And so David starts out and he says, create in me. Create, God, you're the only one who can do it. You're the only one that can reach into a heart and take a heart of stone and change it into a heart of clay. God, you're the only one. The only time this word is used in the Bible, it's always used with with God being the noun. God being the one who's doing the creating. 
God create in me? Now, this word create, it's a verb. And this word create is in the imperative case. Now, some of you are saying, the who? Well, let me just explain to you what it means to be imperative. It means to be a deep cry. It means to be a, almost we can say, a demand. You see, when David wrote this psalm, he wasn't singing it melodiously. He was saying, God, create! Do you understand? Now, some of you get a little nervous if I raise my voice, but that's what David was doing. He had just sinned. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had killed her husband, Uriah, to cover up his sin. And now David is is brought back to repentance through the prophet Nathaniel. Or Nathan, excuse me, Nathan. And David now is crying out from the very depths of his being. He's saying, God created. Only you can do it, but God created me. Created me. You see, David's just not saying something nice and melodic. He's making a demand on God. He's understanding his his need. His need to have a clean heart. I pray this morning that you, as we just look at at just at this verse, that you understand that all of us have a need in our life. And as David cries out, it's like he's crying out and saying, this is my great need. Oh, God, create in me. God, you're the only one that can do it. Create in me in me a clean heart you see when Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said what a desire what a vehement desire actually is the way that first phrase is translated in some language in some versions of the Bible David is or excuse me, Paul is talking about the same thing that David is going through. Almost every one of the things that are listed here in in Psalms 51, almost every one of them except one is in the imperative tense. In other words, it's a deep cry. The only other one is in the justive tense, and that means that it's it's like a moaning. It's like a, a God... Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take it from me. Do you understand? So many times we just read over these verses and we say, oh, they sound so nice. But when you, di- when you dig deeper into it, you get the feeling of the writer. And so understand this morning that repentance brings about a desire in our life that only God can do. And that is to create in me a clean heart. Now, let's look at this word heart. The Hebrew word for the word heart is tehor. Now, what does that mean? This word simply Oh, excuse me, the word for clean is the word tehor, and it just means simply a pure or something that's clean. Now, the way that this word is used in the Hebrew language is it's used in a sense of when a person is purifying gold or purifying a metal. They would take it and they would heat it. And when that metal had all the dross burned out of it, then they would use this word tehor, 
In other words, it is pure. It is pure. So when David is crying out and he's saying, God, create. And then he says, a clean heart. In other words, God, I want to have a heart that has no junk in it. No junk. Let me tell you something. I, I wonder about believers that seem to think that let's see how close we can get to sin without sinning. Have you ever run into something like that? Oh, well, let's see how close we can get to the edge. I was in South Africa several years ago and out on the, on the east coast of South Africa by the Indian Ocean and they got a place called Leopard's Leap. Now, Leopard's Leap is just basically a, a rock that's probably about six or seven feet wide, comes out into a point. And when you walk out onto the edge of that rock, it's, it's a fall for probably, I don't know, I would say probably a thousand feet or better. I mean, it's a long ways down. Okay, now, I walk out on that rock, but I don't get real close to the edge. Okay, first of all, when you're my size, you have to take those things into consideration, you understand? So, I just don't like to get real close to the edge. Do you understand? And I wonder about believers that are always living on the edge. Well, this is permissible. Let's see how close we can get. And then all of a sudden, no! And away they go. You see, when David said, create in me a clean heart, David was saying, I, I want a heart that has nothing to do with sin. I don't want to have, I don't want to come close to sin. I don't want to, I want to run away from sin. Many years ago, I took a, our, our youth group back when I was in Kentucky. We used to do town invasions. And we would go and we would find a pastor that maybe was struggling in a town somewhere. And, and we would get a whole bunch of kids from our youth group. We had a band and we had, we would, we had a guy that had a couple flatbed trailers. He was a semi-driver. And he would pull them over to the Walmart parking lot now. Now, Mrs. Walton was a believer. I don't know if Sam Walton was a believer or not, but she would, we would actually had a, a number we could call, and we would say, okay, we're going to be at this and this Walmart. And by the way, this is not an advertisement, but this, this would happen, okay? And she would say, okay, I'll make sure that you got electricity, okay, which was really nice. And we would pull these, these flatbed trailers there, and we'd set up our band, and we'd witness to people, and share the gospel with people and, and uh, one, we'd get a motel one night I was just getting into into bed and all of a sudden I heard this shriek come from the room next door now we didn't rent the holiday Inn, you understand okay what happened is one of our young men opened the dresser drawer and there was a pornographic magazine in there. But you know what? This young man had such a pure heart that he cried out, Help! Well, that's all you have to do. And Leon's got his trousers back on and he's headed for the room. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? He said, Look! Well, you see, that's the way we need to be toward sin. When sin pops its dirty head, we go, help! God, help me! Create in me a clean heart. A heart that has no dross. A heart that has no foreign objects. Create in me a clean heart. And now the word heart. Now, this is the Greek word lib, L-E-B, 
in the Hebrew language. And it's used over 800 times in the Old Testament. The heart is used as, number one, a seat of desire and will. Okay? A seat of desire and will. Now notice what Exodus 7 verse 14 says. It says, and then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. Okay? What was Pharaoh's heart? His heart was stubborn. In other words, we understand then that, that our heart is where we set our will, is where we make our decisions, okay? Now, let's go on. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord with all your heart. How many of you know love is, a, is an action? Love is something that has to be put into motion with a decision. Now, I know some people, it's not hard to love them. I know a few other people that it's a different case. You have to make a decision. Okay? So your heart is the center of your will or of your decision-making process. How many of you realize that when your heart is right, when your heart has cleanliness in it, when it's clean, when, it, when it's without dross, how many of you realize then that you make decisions that are clean? You make decisions that are pure. Another thing your heart is, it's the seed of knowledge. Deuteronomy 8 verse 5 says, thus you are, thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. What do you do in your heart? You know. You know in your heart. Now, how many of you have ever said, I didn't know it was wrong? Well, let me tell you something. Now, I, I realize that there's some things that you may not know was wrong. I, I don't carry a gun when I'm in Mexico, um, but I was carrying a knife, okay, a little pocket knife. Now, I carry a pocket knife every day. I'm a farmer, okay? I, I was raised as a farmer. I mean, farmers carry knives generally, okay? Got to cut straw bales open or whatever. You know, you carry a knife. Well, I was carrying a knife in Mexico. Well, one of the elders in the church there said, uh, are you carrying a knife? I said, yeah, I carry a knife every day. He said, let me see your knife. I took it out. He said, whoa! He said, this is considered a weapon in Mexico. You are not allowed to have a weapon in Mexico. You are not allowed to own a gun. Now, a lot of people do, but the law says you're not allowed to own a gun. And you are not allowed to carry a knife over two and a half inches. Now, mine was about three inches. Whoa, I didn't know that. But how many of you know when you're making moral decisions, you got something on the inside of you that says, no. How many of you ever had a warning light go off? Maybe in your car. Something like that. No, beep, 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 beep. You know, try to get out of the airport without permission sometime. You push that door by the gate. You know what? You'll find out what a warning light is, okay? Well, the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you. He's here in your repentant heart. And he's there to give you a knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. We live in a society today that tells us where there are no absolute rights and wrongs. Let me tell you something. It's not right. Amen. It's wrong. You understand? There are absolutes. And our heart is the place in which we receive knowledge. Second Samuel 24 verse 10 now David's heart was troubled after him, 
David's heart was troubled, had troubled him after he had murdered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted foolish, very foolishly. What was, what was causing David trouble? It was his heart saying, you've done wrong. Ezekiel, oh, let's just... Yeah, let's just get past that one. Your heart is very important to you. Okay? So your heart is the center of decision. Your heart is the center of knowledge. Now, a pure heart is the source of blessing. Now, this is what Jesus said. Blessed are what? The pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, blessed means fortunate, well off. Who are, the, who are those who are blessed? Who are those who are well off? Those who are pure in heart. Now, it didn't say, for they shall receive one million dollars every day. Didn't say that, did it, Charlie? Didn't say that. Why are we blessed when we have a pure heart? Because we see God. We see God. Now this word, see God, it means that we can intently look at him. David cries out with all of his might. And he says, create in me a clean heart. And then we see Jesus picking up on the same area of our lives. And he says, if you are pure in heart, then you can look intently on God the Father. And how many of you know once you've seen God, things change? Things change. Now, I'm not talking about a physical sight. I'm talking about knowing him and seeing him down here in the depths of your life. So a pure heart brings us to a place of being blessed, fortunate, well off. Matthew 12, verse 34 through 38. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For your mouth speaks of what fills your heart. How do, why does your mouth say some things that you wish it wouldn't say? Anybody have this problem? Now, I confessed to you earlier that I'm still living in repentance. I've said some things about a certain political candidate. Now, I won't tell you who she is. Oh, I just told you. <laughs> that I had to go back and say, God, I'm sorry. You love her. You redeemed her. You, your son Jesus died for her. You know what? I've had to say, God, create in me a heart so that I won't speak bad things. Now, I'm not saying I agree with her because I don't and I won't. I believe in justice for the unborn. Amen. And that should be enough to, I'll just leave it right there. You elders, you don't have to get too nervous. I'm just not going to get to it. <laughs> Do you see, if you want to control your mouth, you need to make sure that the plea of your heart is like David's. God created in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, whether that's cursing, using the Lord's name, gossip, lying, all of those mouth issues, complaining, all of those mouth issues start here. God, create in me a clean heart. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, 
for from it flows the springs of life. Now this, this is a Proverbs, Proverbs 4, verse 23. The Hebrew language pit, paints pictures. And the picture that Solomon would be painting here would be of a river. And he says that from it flows the springs of life. How many of you know rivers have banks? And those banks direct the water in where it's supposed to go. Do you know that when your heart is pure, that your heart then is going to be able to direct your life in a pure way, in a fruitful way, in a way that will be a blessing to, to you and to your family, but also to those that are around you? Your heart will direct your, your paths. Do you understand that? So David, again, cries out and he says, Create in me a clean heart. Because I think David understood that a clean heart, a heart without junk in it, is a heart that can direct the rest of your life. You have problems making decisions? Check your heart. Check your heart. Is there fear there? I know we've made some decisions in the last three months that were not popular. That, to be real honest with you, it cost us stuff. I mean, you know, making decisions for God generally cost you something. Well, you know what? Because I knew that our heart was pure, we could go ahead and lay aside the fear and make the decision. Now, the devil's going to come and he's going to say, You dummy, you stupid, why'd you do that? No, 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 no. Well, you know what? You just go back to a pure heart and say, Hey, Jack, get out of here. Not, not Jack, but anyway. <laughs> hey, just, just get out of here. Do you understand? Why? Because your heart's pure. Because you cry out along with David. David pride create in me a clean heart it's where your treasure is Matthew 6 verse 19 do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Now, when it says treasure there, it's not necessarily talking about money. It's talking about the things that you cherish. What are the things that you are hanging on to? I've got in my office at home, I have a safe. In that safe, I have, a, I have three Bibles. These Bibles are from my great-grandfather. My, on both sides. And one of the Bibles is from my great, great grandfather. Now, if my house catches fire, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell Audrey, Audrey, pick up that safe and carry it outside. Will you? <laughs> no, I'm going to try my best. Actually, it's in a fireproof safe. Why do I treasure those things? Because there's something that are important to me. I'll never sell them. I'll never give them away. In fact, they are so old that it, I, I rarely even open them. But they're, I know they're there. Where's your treasure? Because wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Now, how to have a pure heart very quickly. 
There's one other word that starts with an R-E. Now we talked about repentance and are still talking about it. But there's another word that seems to be absent many times in our society, and it's the word responsibility. I don't want to be responsible. Well, how many of you know God is the one that creates, but yet he gives us responsibility. He gives us what we need to do. Now, this very quickly is what we need to do and will be done. Colossians 3, verse, 20, verse 2, set your mind on things above. Not on things of the earth. What do we do? We take control of our mind, of our thinking, of that decision-making knowledge area of our lives, and we set it on Jesus. That's what we need to do. Sometimes I just need to slap myself. Okay? And sometimes I do physically slap myself. Come on, Leon. Get it right. Get your mind set on things above and not on things on the earth. That is my responsibility. God is not going to reach into your mind and say, Okay, I'm turning, I'm changing your mind. He changes you but he changes only those vessels who are willing to cry out like David cried out, created me a clean heart. So set your mind on things that are above. How to have a pure heart? A clean heart comes from time in the word. Psalms 119 verse 9 says, How can a man, a young man, keep his way pure? By keeping it according to the Word. Are you in the Word? How do you create, or how do you allow God to create in you a clean heart? By keeping yourself fed upon the Word of God. Fed upon the Word of God. Now, I've heard Christians, you know, and they say, well, my pastor just doesn't feed me. Well, let me tell you something. If you've been saved for more than a couple, three years, you ought to be ashamed of yourself thinking that your pastor has to feed you. Now, your pastor, by the way, your pastors and your elders are excellent Bible teachers. I'm, I'm, an, I'm amazed at the word of God that comes out from this pulpit. Okay? But let me tell you something. You need to be in the Word every day. Because when you read the Word, the Word of God will regenerate your thinking. It will renew your mind. That's our responsibility. Saying, God, create in me a clean heart. And then setting our minds on the things above. And keeping our minds filled with the Word of God daily. Now, I went over about six minutes. I hope you're not going to charge me for that. But let me just say this to you as a challenge today. Number one, if you're here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, and yet you're trying to turn over the proverbial new leaf. Let me tell you something. They don't change by themselves. Amen. Believe me, I tried. I tried. And it doesn't work. So I say to you, surrender your life to Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring you to a place of repentance on a daily basis. Bringing you before the Father saying, God, create in me a clean heart every day. Maybe you've walked with the Lord and you kind of slid back into some old stuff. Ask God. God, forgive me first of all. And then, God, I am changing 
my mind. I am serving you with everything that's in me. And for those of you who are here that are walking with God, let me challenge you. Continue to do so. Continue to allow the Holy Spirit to bring up areas in your life that he's not pleased with. Because he, didn't bring, he doesn't bring those areas up in our lives to give us a bad day. He brings those areas up in our lives so that those areas of our lives can experience his life. So continue to follow the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would take these words that have been shared from this pulpit this morning. Holy Spirit, take them, lay them on our hearts continually. Lord, that, our, that the cry of our hearts would be like the cry of David's heart. God, create in me a clean heart. Now, Lord, I ask that you bless these wonderful people and they're coming in and they're going out in the name of Jesus. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages from Georgetown Christian Fellowship, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages.